Oh, sorry, I got it recording to the cloud. Okay. Got All it. Right. All right, thank you, Rich. All right, so Articles of Incorporation. So um, we are um, um, revising our Articles of Incorporation and uh, one of our, our, our reporting, our recording secretary, uh, Kathy Hansen, uh, who has worked closely on that is here and she will be giving you some background on that. And I wanna thank her husband, Tom, who's, who uh, is a, uh, I think still practicing corporate attorney or, or perhaps retired, I'm not sure. But anyway, he helped us profoundly to get this together and we wanna thank him. And again, we are an all volunteer organization and it takes a village to run an all volunteer organization. So we do want to thank Tom for the time that he put in to, uh, to do this. So Kathy, uh, if you would unmute yourself and tell us a little bit about the Articles of Incorporation. All right. Um, the Audubon Society of the Everglades was founded in 1966 with a filing of our original Articles of Incorporation with the state. As the board recently was working on bylaws revisions, we realized that we would also need to um, amend the Articles of Incorporation that go back to 1966. Um, we also, we additionally wanted to officially change the name to Audubon Everglades. And Tom strongly suggested that we should file, instead of just making a lot of amendments to the 1966 um, document, he suggested that we file an amended and restated article of articles of incorporation with the state of Florida. Um, that would allow us to make the changes that we wanted to make and to also update to accommodate any changes that the Florida statutes um, had gone through since 1966. And there were a few things that it was important for us to incorporate in these articles of incorporation that were not in the 1966 document. So what we sent out to you for re your review is this amended and restated Articles of Incorporation, which we want to file with the state of Florida. Um, this document, document does what we want it to do, wanted it to do, and also it simplifies some of the processes that the board takes on behalf of the organization. So we've kind of simplified and, and updated. And if anybody has, if, if you have reviewed this, um, if anybody has any questions about that, um, we will take questions. All right. It's, yeah. If there's no questions at this time. Pretty standard. Yeah. yeah um, uh, Chris Golia will, uh, uh, who's uh, a member of our board of directors, will be uh, basically some reading a summary of the articles that are being uh, revised or changed. Um, so I will I will post them and Chris will share that with you. Oh, we do get one question. Why the name change? Uh, well, the name change actually we, we we reversed. We changed our actually unofficially. We changed our name almost two years ago. And we did that because we felt it was shorter, simpler, easier to remember, and it seemed to be a better way to brand ourselves. Many other chapters who used to have Society of have changed their names as well, uh, including uh, uh, Audubon, Florida. They used to be, uh, be used to have the, the term Society of as well in their name. So this has been a common trend around the country and we're just following fashion, I guess. <laughs> okay, so let's other if there's no other questions. Whoops. Okay, Chris, you're on. Okay, here we go. Amended and restated articles of incorporation overview. Article one, 
officially changed the name of our chapter to Audubon Everglades Incorporated. Article two, update the chapter mailing address. Article three, clarify that Audubon Everglades shall be operated exclusively for educational and charitable purposes in accordance with the requirements of section 501c3 and that all of the assets of the chapter shall be used exclusively for that purpose. Articles four and five state that the election, appointment and number of officers and directors as well as their duties shall be specified in the bylaws of Audubon Everglades. Scott, you gonna advance? I did, sorry, sorry. Wake up, Scott. <laughs> Thanks. Article seven, add a registered officer name and address. Articles eight and nine, update that the power to change the bylaws and the articles of incorporation shall be vested in the board of directors in the manner provided by law. Article 10, include in the dissolution article that the remaining assets of the chapter shall be distributed by the board of directors who will assure the continued effective use of such assets for educational and conservation purposes, similar to those of the chapter prior to its dissolution. Article 11, add a limitations article, which states that no part of the chapter's assets shall inure to the benefit of its directors, officers, members, or to the benefit of any private individual. Okay, thank you, Chris. So are there any more, does anyone have any other questions or comments that they would like to ask or, or to make regarding the uh, amended articles of incorporation? Remember to unmute yourself if you want to ask it, or you can share it in the chat. Scott, we have one in the chat. Okay. A couple, couple of them. Uh, one one uh, question is, did we change the name also in the 501c3 filing? I guess that's the question. Yeah, yes, yeah, the, the, the name will be changed and um, we will, you know, it and um, from there on when, sh when Luann files our tax returns and um, or, you know, whatever she, she files with the government uh, confirming that we are a 5013C, yes, the name will be officially changed on, uh, on all of that. And there's an, a question about Article Three, um, but I think the question really is concerning our purposes. Okay, yeah. Um, I think. Well, we have we have promoting an understanding of an interest in birds, wildlife, and the environment that supports it, and furthering the cause of conservation of all natural resources. So basically, we are including conservation work um, in general. Yeah, we felt that wording it that way was more all inclusive and allowed us to work on areas that are, for example, climate change issues also affect, affect birds. So that's more of a broader issue and that wouldn't fall under a, a, more, a more limited definition. So that's one of the reasons we went with that, with that broader terminology. We have another one, another uh, question. Who would be the official person with the amendment? Who's, our, who's the official person? Okay, Tom, who has volunteered to be our attorney, is filing the amendments for us. He will file those with the state. We will get confirmation that that has been filed. Luann will then um, take that confirmation to um, our banks and um, and have the names officially changed there. She will show that then when she does our required filings every year. Um, 
So Tom, Tom is going to handle the filing. It will, it costs about, it'll cost about a hundred dollars to do this amended filing and get confirmation that that has been done. Um, does that, does that answer the question? Uh, there's a thank you, Tom, for volunteering, by the okay. way, <laughs> which is really sweet. He is, he is recently retired, so this was kind of nice to, for him to have a project. He did not mind at all. Okay. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Okay. Uh, any other questions? I don't... Oh, uh, I just want to ask, uh, I'm Elwood Bracey. I was president of the Audubon through the 70s. Sure. We had very active conservation committee and Sissy Durando used to uh, um, appear at, at county and, and local West Palm Beach meetings to give objections to certain developments that she felt or the committee felt were not in the best interest of uh, wildlife, et cetera. And I just want to know, is that kind of activism <clears throat> given any place and does it still go on or is it strictly an educational kind of thing now that uh, Audubon promotes? No, it definitely goes on and Scott is pretty much responsible for that. And he often will advise us when there is something important happening at the county or a city uh, level and have other people accompany him to make um, um, you know, their views known about something that the, the, they, they are considering. So Scott can talk about that a little bit more, but he probably doesn't want to blow his own horn, but he does an awful lot of work for us um, as far as all sorts of conservation uh, measures. And that has not been an easy process for the last four years. So um, yes, Scott, you might want to say something as well. Well, Thank you. I, you. You seem to summarize it very well. Uh, <laughs> just, uh, Elwood, you might have seen, I don't know if you get our conservation alerts, but I actually sent one out last week just on the um, Nichols, Nichols property down in, in Boynton Beach uh, that where they, it was 14.7 acres that they wanted to develop that was defeated. So uh, it, it is not going to, it's going to stay a forested area and it's not going to be developed. And a number of uh, a number of our members uh, wrote letters and called in regarding that issue. So we are still active. I do attend meetings. I go to county meetings. I go to sometimes municipal meetings. I go to those long uh, uh, board meetings at South Florida Water Management District, which sometimes can last literally seven hours. Uh, so yes, yes, we are still active, Ellen. Well, good going, Scott. Glad to hear the tradition that Sissy uh, brought up out at, in olden times is still going on. Yeah, and Sissy was great. I, I know when I joined the organization, she was still active and it was always great hearing her at meetings. All right, any other questions? There is one about the timing. Um, assuming that we pass this um, articles of incorporation this evening. Tom will process, will will file, and that's done very quickly. So, um, and and even now we've been unofficially using the term yeah, the the name Audubon Everglades. So if you write a check to Audubon Everglades right now, that is fine. Um, let me see if there's anything else. Okay. Okay, I think that's it. All right, so let's go to the the actual interesting part of this. Now we will vote. Okay, so um, we're going to need 25 members, and we have over 50 people on the on the on the Zoom meeting right now for a quorum, and a two thirds majority for the motion to pass. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, on in a moment put a poll on the screen. And that poll will allow you to vote. It'll have a yes or a no option. Uh, please choose yes or no to vote to accept the articles as amended or to, to reject the articles as amended. Um, and once you're once again it's approved, it will be filed with the state of Florida. So I'm going to put that poll on now. You need a motion first? 
No, no, I'm gonna put the, oh, that's true. We do need a motion. Thank you. Uh, I am forgetting all my steps here. Motion. Well, may, hello, everyone. May we have a motion to accept the amended and restated articles of incorporation as posted on the AE website? Yes, this is Scott Lawrence. I will gladly entertain the motion to accept the amended articles of incorporation as posted on the Audubon Everglades website. Good Thank work, you guys. Thank you, Scott Lawrence. May we have a second, please? I will second. second it. This is Kristen Murtaugh, I'll second it. Okay, thank you, Kristen Murtaugh, for seconding the motion. All right, so now we will conduct the poll. Whoops, I'm going way too fast here with my mouse. It is out of control. Okay, all right, uh, wait, okay, now we'll do it. Uh, okay, polling. Okay, so um, can you all see the poll? No. <laughs> no, oh, launch poll, sorry, that's why. That's why you can't see it. All right, now can you all see the poll? Yes. yes. Great, so again, uh, do you accept the Audubon Everglades amended and restated articles of incorporation as written and posted on the Audubon Everglades website? And already 23, 24 have voted yes, we have our quorum, 100% uh, so far, 35, 36, 40. How many people do we have on the, on the thing right now? We have 52. Some of them, some of us, a couple of us can't vote because we're hosts. We have 42. Um, I'll give another 30 seconds to allow anyone else who hasn't had a chance to vote to vote. It's going to get saved. I want to say participants. So 43 now, still 100%. 44. 91% of the people have voted. That's great. That's even better than the national average for this election, which I think is 70%. <laughs> Thought I'd tie that in. A nice little segue. <laughs> That's not much of a criteria, you know. <laughs> no, I, well, that was one of the greatest percentages we've had in a very long time. Okay, so, so give me your, your final okay. totals. All right, so I'm gonna do that now. I'm gonna end the poll and then we'll see our final totals. Okay, share results. Okay, so um, the vote was 44 yes and zero no's. So 100% thank you everyone for voting. Uh, you are contributing to the Audubon Everglades democratic way of doing business by your participation today. All right, uh, thanks again. And so now we can, we can continue. I'm gonna, I'm gonna end the poll. Uh, okay, so uh, birding season, unfortunately, we are still have our events canceled through January 31st. If you've been watching the news, um, COVID-19 cases are once again increasing in Florida, uh, testing uh, positivity rates are increasing and hospitalizations are increasing. I don't know what the future stores past January 31st. We will be uh, watching things closely. Uh, we will be discussing it at our board meetings and hopefully at some point in the not too distant future, we could get back to what we love doing, which is going on these wonderful birding field trips. But we will, let's all, let's all like, let's all practice social distancing, wear masks and of course, wash our hands way too many times during the day. All right, uh, uh, this was spoken about before. Again, this was a great victory. Uh, Nichols Boulevard uh, forest area was preserved, 14.7 acres. Was they offer, uh, the offer was 3.1 million to develop it. And that offer was rejected by the um, uh, Boynton Beach commissioners. And that was because they had a lot of community pressure, pressures from organizations, pressure from people calling in from around the county. And it's, it's these kinds of actions by us that will preserve these critical areas uh, in, in, the, in the future and hopefully for a long time. All right, uh, so I'm gonna be featuring one area for volunteering every month. Uh, this month, uh, it's a board position. Uh, we are looking for a corresponding secretary. This is a new position on the board. Uh, and you will be an active member of the leadership team. 
uh, and you'll be basically handling the correspondences for the organization that go out to the membership from the board and from committees. You'll be doing that both snail mail and electronic mail messaging. And it's a very important position. Uh, we, it would very much streamline the activities and center all of those correspondences in one person's hands. And this way it is not stretched out kind of inconsistently in many people's hands. Uh, and of course we would have a kind of unified message, which is what we want as an organization. So if you are interested in that position, please, please contact me at info at audubonevergladesorg And remember that is a board position, so you will have to be approved for the position by the board and then by and then be nominated and approved by the membership in March. So that new slate of officers will be going up in February to the membership. You'll be seeing that everybody. And then you'll be voting on that in March. And this position of corresponding secretary is one of the positions that we hope to fill. So if you're interested, please get in touch and we will tell you more about the position. We will help train you on the electronic tools that you'll be using uh, to fulfill the uh, duties of the position. And um, so we hope to hear from you, whoever you are. I know you're out there. So <laughs> be, be, be getting, so be sure to get in touch. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, if you have any questions, please put them on the chat at the bottom of your screen for all questions you have for our two presenters this evening, as you know. And I will be reading those questions to the presenters and they will be an answering them in their usual brilliant fashion. All right, so now we have our bird of the month with Clive and Cece Pinnock and they are doing, I'm gonna let them tell you. Clive and Cece, take it away. All right. Uh, I'm going to stop Clive. sharing my screen. Hang on. Okay, you can share your screen now, Clive. Okay. Okay. There we go. All right. Um, uh, hi, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. We are excited about continuing with our bird of the month series and of course this month we are focusing on the fulvus whistling duck um pretty interesting uh information about this these guys they actually started showing up in in uh, the 1960s uh they are originally found in warm freshwater marshes uh, across the americas and from africa and asia as well um the uh, actual description of the bird, uh, as you look at it, uh, if you look at waterfowl in general on a regular basis, you could see that this bird, along with the black-bellied whistling duck, uh, they're shaped very, very differently mm -hmm. from uh, our typical mod, um, our, our typical waterfowl. Uh, you can see from the long legs and the long neck. Uh, that tells you uh, right away that these birds are slightly different from most of the other waterfowl that we have in the area. Uh, the females actually are said to have a darker crown and uh, black nape uh, than the males, which is quite unusual um, for birds. You'll notice that they've got that uh, rusty body, a dark, very dark back and uh, wings with blotches of brown on it. And notice the color on the uh, beak and the legs are, are gray as well. So very odd looking, very different looking waterfowl from the ones that we generally uh, would have. Um, in flight, uh, there's also something quite interesting. Notice the uh, rump area and the tail. Uh, there's actually a contrast in black and white uh, where the rump is actually black. There's a white uh, band uh, beyond that. And then the edge of the tail itself is black. Notice that these birds also fly with outstretched legs and, uh, and feet. The wings are quite dark and the leading edge of the wings have a, a really nice chestnut, uh, warm chestnut color to it. Okay. Um, as far as distribution throughout the United States, you can see there uh, on the range map that they are spread 
throughout, but they're very concentrated in the uh, second half, the lower half of our state. Um, they're actually considered or classified as uh, a local permanent resident in the southern half of uh, our peninsula. They are rare and unpredictable uh, further north and west, and also rare sightings of them in the Keys. Uh, interestingly, the numbers are concentrated around Lake Apopka, uh, the upper St. St. John's River marshes, and in the agricultural area south of Lake Okeechobee. So uh, interesting how they've distributed themselves. Notice also there too on the map that they're spread throughout uh, Cuba and throughout the Do Dominican Republic. And we're gonna mention Cuba again uh, later on, but um, it's interesting where these birds seem to congregate uh, themselves. Um, they are regularly found in freshwater marshes. Uh, that's the habitat that they uh, tend to prefer. And in particular, rice fields where it's flooded, they have access to rice grains and the seeds, but it also makes it uh, available for them to reach a lot of aquatic invertebrates. Generally, the water in these habitats are usually about 20 inches or so, and so it makes it very, very easy for these birds to be able to acquire their foods. Um, they uh, have an interesting method of feeding. Not only are they dabblers, but they will also uh, take food from the surface of the water. A large advantage that they have uh, is the broad bill that they have. And also um, the bill is designed with a lot of comb-like structures around the edges of it. The, those structures are called lamellae and it actually enables these birds to sift through soft mud to uh, get to the seeds and the aquatic invertebrates. Um, their uh, primary plant material uh, is focused on rice, green algae, seeds of wheat, sedges, uh, different types of grasses, as well as smart weed and wild millet. The invertebrate portion of their diet uh, includes earthworms, midges, uh, water beetles, dragonflies, snails, uh, and other types of mollusks. Um, in regards to reproduction, it's quite interesting uh, among ducks. Uh, the uh, Phobos whistling duck pairs generally mate for life. They form permanent pair bonds. However, males do occasionally copulate with more than one female, uh, but that's a rarity. Generally, uh, they're monogamous in, by nature, and so the males will focus on uh, generally just one female. Courtship generally begins in uh, around April, sometimes a little earlier. And even though the pair bonds are established permanently, they will from uh, each year uh, do through courtship behavior. Uh, it is believed to affirm or solidify the pair bond between the male. Um, uh, also, interestingly, uh, the male and female will search for the appropriate nest location. They usually will fly low and locally over uh, grassland habitat, shrubby areas, things of that sort. Once they locate a potential nest site, both will participate in building the nest and they'll use a lot of the local vegetation that's available to them right there at the site. Um, once the nest is built, both male and female will participate in incubating uh, the, the eggs, which again is quite different from most other waterfowl that nest in our region. Um, about 12 to 14 eggs are laid. Once those eggs are laid, then incubation begins in earnest. Uh, there's a delay in actually incubating the eggs until the entire clutch is made. Um, uh, there's some nest dumping that is typical uh, among this species as well. And by that, I mean females will sometimes lay their eggs in the nests of other almost whistling ducks, and uh, which will cause uh, quite numbers 
of eggs. Uh, records have been uh, found where there have been 60 plus eggs uh, of these fulvous whistling ducks in one nest. I can only imagine what is involved in trying to incubate that many eggs. But um, again, the male and female do uh, participate in the incubation uh, of the eggs. Generally, that incubation period lasts 24 to 26 uh, days. And the precocial chicks hatch with uh, completely covered in down. And because they're precocial by nature, usually within the first couple of hours, they are ready to leave the nest. The male and female will escort them to a nearby water source. And uh, at that point, the young are able to glean aquatic insects for themselves. The parents will spend their time watching over, caring for the young. But again, the young are the ones that, uh, the young are able to feed themselves. At that age, they focus predominantly on aquatic uh, insects for the protein uh, source to be able to, for growth and for bone development. And uh, so the parents basically just focus on protecting and taking care of them, but the young feed themselves. Um, uh, just a, a fun fact um, with these guys, the record as far as the age of the Phobos whistling duck is uh, 11 years and two months. And uh, uh, the, uh, that record was attained by a male that was actually unfortunately shot by a hunter in Cuba. The bird was banded here in Florida in 1993, uh, but it was actually killed in Cuba uh, in 2004. So that record uh, currently holds for that species at 11 years and two months, which is pretty amazing um, when you think about it. Uh, the population here, uh, the resident population here uh, in Florida as then the word implies, uh, remains here year round. But there is some migration that takes place uh, from uh, the southwestern regions into Mexico and back again. Molting for the species actually takes place usually after uh, the young have howl that will molt during the incubation period. Uh, these birds actually molt after the young have hatched. Um, so that's about it in a nutshell. Uh, Scott, if you have any questions for me, I'll be more than happy to uh, respond to those if I can. I see no questions in the chat yet. If you have questions for Clive, please put them in the chat and I will ask them of Clive. I have a question or two, Clive. Yeah. Uh, I, so um, with the Fulvis Whistling Duck, how come we see so much fewer of them than we see of black-bellied whistling ducks, which we see in fairly large numbers all over Palm Beach County, east and west. And fulvis, you'll only see west and seldomly will you ever see them in large numbers. Yeah, it's interesting because the, the, rec, the information actually says that from, at times where they are concentrated in optimal feeding areas, they can, especially outside of the breeding season, where they are quite gregarious, they actually can gather together by the hundreds and sometimes over a thousand birds. Wow. Uh, but again, it seems that that congregation or those gatherings are usually in specific optimum areas as opposed to the black-bellied whistling ducks that seem to be more generalized in their um, habitat requirements. Uh, a question from Mary Dunning is, where is a good place to see them? Say again, a good where, place uh, to Mary, see them. Yeah, Mary, I've actually seen, uh, I've actually seen fulvuses out at um, um, Peaceful Waters. Uh, generally, um, we'll get some also up at uh, Merritt Island but generally uh, uh, peaceful waters is where I usually will see them. I, I myself have seen them. I know Rick can probably, Rick is on here. 
I've seen them in the STA uh, One East uh, a number of times on trips there. I've also seen them over the summer with chicks, with ducklings, excuse me, uh, in the ag fields um, when they're, when they're in, in, during breeding season. So that's some, another place I would recommend. Rick, any, any, any recommendations? I can't speak for the summer because you know I'm a snowbird. Yes. But uh, STA1 East and STA2, we see them fairly regularly. So when we have trips again, I recommend you sign up for those trips if you want to see a fulvous whistling duck. Hopefully, that's true. Hopefully, see it. That's true. Mary, yeah. my wife Mary just reminded me. Uh, anyway, um, any other questions for Clive? I see no other questions in the chat. So uh, uh, Sheila Calderon says, thank you as always, Clive, for a great presentation and for the love that you give to the birds. Okay, so uh, let's, I'm gonna share my screen again. And All right, so our featured program today is our featured speaker. This evening is Dan O'Malley, and you see some photos of him there on the screen. Uh, the one on the left is a more recent photo, and the one on the right I happened to find on the internet after doing a search. I'm not sure where it was taken or when it was taken, but I think Dan was a few years younger there and, and, and had a little less facial hair. Um, and I think many of us have been through those kinds of periods. I know I have. Anyway, our featured speaker this evening is Dan O'Malley, who hails from Rhode Island, where he fell in love uh, uh, in, with coastal environments at a young age. Uh, he, pr he pursued his passion at Tulane University, where he was introduced to ornithology, and where he received his BA at Nichols State University, where he received his master's. Uh, there, he was also involved in the ornithological research and birded the beautiful Louisiana coast. After graduate school, Dan worked for the Natural Heritage Program at the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, where he developed and conducted research and monitoring projects on birds and other wildlife. And he moved to Florida afterwards, where he worked with the uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission on marine habitat restoration and bird conservation projects until 2019. Uh, by the way, Dan now works as a registered nurse in, Gaines, in the Gainesville area. So you might say he has gone from actively conserving birds to conserving us humans, which is a good thing. Uh, most people who know Dan consider him an expert birder, I know I do. And he says that he was fortunate in it, he was fortunate during his time in Louisiana to be mentored by a number of expert ornithologists associated with the renowned LSU Museum of Natural Sciences. Like most birders, Dan keeps a life list, but what's really fascinating is that he also keeps a birds caught by hand list, no nets or traps used. This list includes brown pelicans, royal tern, common gallinal, brown creeper, tufted titmouse, Tennessee warbler, yellow warbler, yellow rumped warbler, and black faced grass quit. That's quite a list of caught by hand birds. Uh, Dan seems to do some of his best birding while on the move. And he lays claim to two first state records for Louisiana and a first island record for Bonaire. And none of these sightings took place while on foot. Instead, they were seen by truck, by boat, and from horseback. Extraordinary. I wonder what an eBird reviewer would say to that. And it just so happens that Dan can speak to that during his presentation tonight, eBird, from a volunteer regional reviewer's perspective. And so without further ado, I give you Dan O'Malley. Please applaud in front of your computer screens. Thank you, everybody. All right, and Dan, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and you can share your screen and take over. All righty. Well, thank you, Scott, for that awesome introduction. And let me just get this in the uh, full screen mode here for everyone. All right, there we go. 
All right, so good evening, everyone. Um, like Scott said, I'm Dan O'Malley. I'm the one of three volunteer uh, regional reviewers for uh, eBird for Palm Beach County. Um, and I just wanted to start with a disclaimer that any opinions or views expressed during these presentations are mine and mine alone. They don't necessarily um, represent those of eBird or any of their sponsoring organizations like um, National Audubon or the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. I'm just trying to present what my experience has been like um, as a volunteer a regional reviewer for eBird. All right, and so many of you are already active eBird contributors, and I just wanted to start right from the top thanking you all for your participation in the program. You know, it really relies on volunteer contributors to submit their sightings to the database, to build the database and make it more valuable. Um, so thanks to all of you. Um, but for those of you that may not be familiar with what eBird is all about, um, it's a citizen science project that seeks to compile bird observations into a gigantic database um, that can be used to track the occurrence and abundance of birds over time. And really any other kinds of information that they can, scientists and conservation practitioners can glean from that huge database. All right, and so while we're on the subject of what is the purpose of eBird, um, so as we just covered, the primary purpose is to compile observations into um, this enormous database that's used for conservation and science and research. Um, but it also, there's a number of other um, aspects of eBird that are basically used to kind of try to encourage people to use the program. You know, it's a lot of extra work to go and out when you're birding and keep a full checklist of everything you're seeing and trying to keep accurate estimates of all the different kinds of species you're seeing. And it's a lot of work. And so they try to give back to birders by providing things to them that they are that will benefit them when they submit their observations to eBird. So a few of these things are, are basically, um, eBird's kind of taken over the role of listing software for some of the um, more senior birders in the crowd, more veteran birders, they might remember a time when people would have bought uh, listing software programs where they could upload their checklist into and they would automatically compute their year list or their county or state or country list or, or whichever way you'd like to slice your lists up. And in the era of eBird, that eBird will do that for you if you submit all your sightings through their platform. Um, also, it seems to have taken over the role of a lot of the bird reporting um, avenues that previously were used by birders to communicate uh, rare sightings or unusual birds and that's things of that nature. Um, you know, we've kind of seen the decline of a lot of listservs. I know that Audubon Everglades recently um, discontinued its Yahoo Groups um, listserv in the, in the past uh, year, I believe. And that's kind of been all throughout. A lot of birders now, instead of posting their, their sightings to uh, a listserv or, you know, Facebook group or some other kind of forum, they'll just put them on eBird and any birders that are interested can kind of go on there and see what people have been seeing lately. Um, so those, and you can also get um, rare birds alerts. You can get your needs alerts for what birds you need for your specific county or state or life list, list that have been seen near you um, through eBird, through automated emails that they have based on just the sightings that everyone's putting into the, into the platform. Um, and so those are all kind of ancillary uh, facets of eBird, um, you know, they don't really get to the main purpose of eBird, which is building the database so it can be used for research and science and conservation. All right, and so we'll get in next into who can submit to eBird. Some of you may not be active contributors already, and you may be interested after seeing this talk and becoming an active contributor. And what do you need to do to be able to contribute your sightings? Well, all you need to do is sign up for an account. Um, you don't need actually to have any kind of training going on to submit checklists. Um, and so this is beneficial in that it can recruit a very wide base of volunteers, but there's also a downside um, in that, you know, you're potentially sacrificing a little bit of quality control and having people who aren't necessarily very experienced in birding submitting checklists to eBird 
um, you know, to allow yourself to have the most possible number of people to submit. And so there's a little uh, cartoon up in the left corner there about, you know, the great backyard bird count. And that's a time of year where as eBird reviewers, we see a lot of questionable sightings pop up. It's a time of year when uh, the eBird program really tries to recruit new people into, into eBird and to get them to look and see what's in their backyard and try to identify it and try to submit it to the database. And so you get some really wacky sightings um, during the great backyard bird count in February. Um, so, you know, we all kind of know to look out for it at this point who've been doing it for a while. Um, but when you first start being an eBird reviewer, you, you can kind of be confused where all of a sudden you have these a lot of bizarre records turn up in February. Um, and you realize this because, you know, they're, they're trying to have all these new birders come in. And, you know, this isn't to, to denigrate or to, you know, talk bad about beginning birders, right? We've all been beginning birders at one point. We're all learning new stuff all the time. That's part of um, what makes birding great is that you're continually learning, you're continually improving on yourself and on your identification skills. But for the sake of a database that's trying to compile uh, the most accurate observations that it can, um, you know, having, you know, no uh, minimum training required and letting anyone that's interested submit observations um, does present a lot of challenges um, for having a database that um, contains accurate sightings and can be uh, effectively used for conservation and for science. And that's unlike a lot of other birding, or excuse me, a lot of other citizen science projects, like for anyone that has done a breeding bird survey, which is a long running citizen science project um, that's administered by the USGS. Um, you know, there's a, it's not much training, but there's a little bit of training that you have to do as far as the protocols of how to submit your data and how to collect your data and those types of things. Um, and, and eBird doesn't have any of that. So that, that presents a little bit of a challenge um, on the review side and on the quality control side. And then we also have what we like to call visiting birder syndrome. So a lot of us are experts or, you know, fairly well versed in our local birds and how to identify them and what to expect and what season. Um, but once we go on a trip, we're really excited to do a lot of birding and see a lot of new stuff we haven't seen before. You know, we're able to identify much less of what we see in the field, what we hear in the field. Um, and so from a eBird perspective, a lot of times you'll see um, people submitting checklists that have questionable observations where they're kind of making assumptions based on what they're used to on their home turf um, that don't really hold up where they're at. Or you also see a lot of times uh, birders who are visiting, especially in South Florida, where you have a lot of specialty species, um, you know, stuff like reddish egret, stuff like mangrove cuckoo, where they're expecting to see certain, they're hoping and expecting to see certain species when they come to visit. And so they're maybe more likely to lean that way on any kind of questionable ID calls that they have. So you'll notice um, a lot of your questionable sightings on those types of things will come from your visiting birders. And just a humorous way we refer to that as reviewers is as a visiting birder syndrome. Um, I know when I first took over or not took over, but when I was first added as a reviewer um, for eBird for Palm Beach County, um, one of the things that I changed on the, the filters, which we'll get into in a minute, um, was that I set the reddish eager filter to zero uh, because even though that's relatively common, common to uncommon species in the county, like it's not a crazy rare bird to find along the coast in Palm Beach at certain times of year, uh, we had a lot of visiting birders who would be at sites like like Green K or Wakota Hatchie, freshwater sites that aren't really great habitat for reddish egret will be submitting reddish egret sightings. And when I looked through all the reddish egret sightings from those kind of sites, those freshwater sites, it was all visiting birders. It wasn't anyone that I noticed from being on Audubon Everglades trips, from being in the field with um, at different birding sites around the county. So it's all people who weren't very familiar with the distribution of the birds, the specialty birds that we have down here, and who are maybe expecting to see those birds and hoping to see those birds. And, and that might have influenced um, the way that they identified them in the field and reported them to eBird. 
All right, so uh, I kind of touched on some of this stuff already, but you know, why does eBird need reviewers? Misidentifications are common. Um, birding, bird ID is difficult, right? That's why a lot of us are interested in birding. Um, it's in part for the challenge. You know, we like to continually be improving on our skills at ID to be faced with challenges and have to use our, our skills that we have to try to identify a tough to identify bird. And that doesn't always work out great. You know, uh, misidentifications are very common. I misidentify birds on the regular myself. Uh, I've been with birders who I consider to be much better than me that I witness make misidentifications. Um, and Pete Dunn has a, has a famous quote that sums it up pretty well. And what he said is that uh, the difference between a beginning birder and an experienced one is that beginning birders have misidentified a few birds experienced type birders have misidentified thousands, right? So it's a constant learning process. You know, you learn from your mistakes. Um, and I'm sure we all look back to when we were beginning birders and thinking about, you know, sightings that we had that maybe looking back knowing more than we knew then or, or maybe we have second thoughts about or we think, you know, are maybe a little questionable. So uh, misidentifications are common and um, for a, a building a database that you want to be full of accurate sightings, um, it's important to just have a check on those. Um, also, you know, you have eBird is basically used by a lot of birders, maybe not necessarily entirely, but in part as, you know, their primary listing software that they're using to build their lists of all their county and state and year uh, totals. You also have the top 100, which is a feature that shows um, who has the highest list for a particular county or state for a particular year for all time. So there's a little bit of a competitive listing aspect to eBird. Um, and that kind of encourages, you know, people to be a little bit more liberal perhaps with the sightings that they're uh, submitting to eBird because they want to see their, their name at the top of the list. They want to see their numbers as high as they can be. Um, and then the next thing really is just data entry errors. So this is something that I'm guilty of. I think everyone um, who's ever submitted any checklist to eBird is, has been guilty of, is that, you know, it's pretty easy when you're in the field, especially if you're using the app and you want to say that you saw two of a certain bird and your thumb hits the one and then the two, and then all of a sudden there's 12 instead of two on the checklist, right? And if that's a pretty rare bird, you know, that's a significant change in, in the number of birds that are being seen for that species. Um, and so I've been on both ends of that where I've um, sent emails questioning people like, uh, for instance, redheaded, uh, excuse me, redheaded woodpecker was one of the birds that I set the filter to back to zero on when I came on as an eBird reviewer for Palm Beach. And a couple of the records that came up were from, you know, well-regarded experienced birders from other parts of the state who had come to check out the McGillivray's warbler um, that had been at Bush Wildlife a couple years back in the fall. And when I sent them the email, you know, oh, hey, you know, redheaded uh, woodpecker is a pretty good bird for Palm Beach. It's kind of local. Did you really see it over there at Bush? And they said, no, I don't remember that at all. It must have, I must have meant red-bellied woodpecker, you know, and I just, I hit the wrong thing on there. And, and that's an easy, that's an easy thing to do. So that's, you know, another reason why the um, eBird reviewers are important to have just to make sure that the, the quality of data going into the database is as good as it can be. Um, and that's a little bit insensitive um, to, to call, you know, questionable records or unverified records as garbage, but the old saying in statistics for any kind of statistical model or any kind of database is that if you put garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. Um, and, you know, it's important um, as a professional a wildlife biologist in my former career, we would look at eBird um, when we were trying to decide what species that were going to get ranked as, you know, imperiled species or species of conservation need. And if the data going into, into the, the program isn't accurate, you know, the conclusions that people who are, are making um, decisions that can have an impact on the way that conservation dollars are spent uh, are made, um, you know, that's, that's a serious issue. So that's why eBird kind of needs reviewers and kind of uh, the reason for the role that myself and uh, several other volunteer reviewers have for Palm Beach County. 
All right, and so the next question um, is kind of like, how does eBird know which sightings to flag? Um, and so the way this works, and I'll show you a view of kind of a behind the scenes look at some of these filters is how they're called um, a little later in the presentation. But basically any bird that's not expected to be in a certain location for a certain area won't be included on the checklist. And so if you try to add that to your checklist, you'll get a little nudge from the, the program, whether you, you're using the app or you're using the website. And it'll say, hey, are you basically, can you provide some more details on this? Are you, you, are you sure that you saw uh, the species at this spot? Um, so another thing to bring up here is that any bird that's not on the, that default checklist gets flagged as rare. And there's really no distinction on that. There's a little bit of a color coding system that's been added to the app um, on some of the newer updates where it'll give you a red. If it's something that's really rare, it'll give you uh, an orange if it's less rare. But basically it's gonna get flagged whether it's a common seasonal residence that's maybe one week early or one week late or one day earlier, one day late, um, or if it's a first state record or first uh, county record or first continental record, right? It's just, it's a computer program that's just built to automatically send that out. Um, and that's something that you kind of hear complained about a little bit when you're dealing with other eBird users. And I've been guilty of kind of, of thinking the same way myself where, you know, you want to look at your rare bird report for the county or the state that you're interested in. And it can be a little frustrating when you're getting, you have to sort through a lot of stuff that's really not rare. Um, it's kind of uncommon and it just sets off the filter because it's maybe a little early, maybe a little late. Um, maybe it's a, an ID. Uh, difficult ID and that's why it sets off the filter. Um, but I just wanted to bring that up is that, um, you know, it's the, it's going to flag it either way, whether it's super rare or just barely makes, you know, barely needs to get double checked before it gets added in there. All right. And so another thing about filters is that they're set at the county level. Um, Palm Beach County is a very large county, as you guys know, who've, you know, driven all the back roads and the EAA and, you know, had to drive an hour or more to go chase some, some bird that you're hoping to see at a particular spot. Um, and so it's difficult uh, for an area that, that is that large and also, you know, includes a lot of different habitat types to set one filter that is going to make sense for the entire county. Basically, the way the filters are set, there's kind of three main factors, the, the seasonality aspect. So for anything that's not resident throughout the entire year, uh, when is it present? So if it's, um, they typically leave by a certain date, after that date, the filter is generally going to be automatically set to zero, um, just so that you'll have to get a documentation on that. Um, that's something that we're seeing. Um, lately with a lot of climate change going on is that the seasonality of our birds are shifting a little bit with stuff arriving earlier, staying later. Um, and so even though, you know, your bird might only be one day late, two days late, um, you know, we want to make sure that we have uh, accurate documentation on that um, because that is something that, that we're seeing um, changing uh, with kind of the changing uh, times. And then also just basically is it present or not in the area and then also the third factor is the abundance so um, the filter can be set to different numbers of a, of a particular species being seen um, and so based on how common a bird is the filter might be uh, might trip when you see five or more of a species or if it's very common you might have to see you know several hundred before the uh, filter is going to trip to where it's going to ask you um, yeah, you know, to provide some more details on that sighting. Um, yeah, and so there's, there are some areas in, in different states and in, in our region, uh, the Florida Keys is an, is an example where they've been able to set different filters. So there's a different filter for mainland Monroe County and a different filter for um, the islands um, of the Keys. Uh, but in Palm Beach County and in most other counties all throughout the United States, the, the filters are set at the county level. All right, and so this is just kind of more about the filters. We talked about um, 
having a large county and having diverse habitats in the county being an issue for setting filters that make sense. Um, and so we have a lot of species that are kind of locally distributed or they're habitat specialists. Um, and so for those species, even though seasonally they can be pretty common, like if you wanted to go see a sooty or bridal turn in the summer months off of Palm Beach County and you had access to a boat, you could pretty much do that any day that you wanted to and you'd see more than one. Um, I've seen sooty bridal turns um, pretty close to shore, like outside of scope range, but um, you know, in between dives on a dive boat, you know, right off of Palm Beach, you know, I've seen sooty, sooty turns flying by in the summer, but the filter set to zero for Palm Beach County because very few people ever cover those areas for eBird checklists. And it's a, it's a kind of underappreciated ID challenge. A lot of birders even, uh, intermediate or advanced level birders who might not be particul particularly familiar with seabirds will misidentify study turns a lot. Like I've had friends who are professional wildlife biologists that specialize on birds tell me, oh, hey, yeah, I, I saw a study turn the other day. And you'll say, wow, really? You saw a study turn, you know, on in an estuary? And they'll say, yeah, yeah, it was black all over. It was a study turn. And you'll say, well, are you sure it wasn't a black turn? And I'll say, well, I don't know. And you'll tell them a little more about it and you'll come to the conclusion that, you know, this probably was a black turn. Um, so that's kind of another factor that filters into the reviewer's decision on how they want to set the filters. If there's, you know, an ID pitfall um, that's going to potentially cause some confusion, they're more likely to set the filters a little more conservatively for species like that. Um, and, uh, as you can see on the, the right side of the screen here, you got a sooty turn on top and then a bridal turn on bottom. Um, uh, common uh, behavioral characteristic that's used to separate these species, it's almost always accurate, is that the bridal turns, they really like to sit on any kind of floating debris. Uh, like this one is on, uh, looks like a bam some kind of a bamboo uh, log here. Um, whereas the sooty terns are more likely to uh, not do that. They're more airborne when you see them on the pelagic habitats. And so just another example of the same kind of thing, um, red-headed woodpecker. Um, it's not super rare to see in Palm Beach County, right? If you wanted to go find one, you could go out and do that pretty much any time of year if you know where to look. Um, but you have to go to a very specific area to look for them. Uh, mostly Loxahatchee area, um, Wellington a little bit is where they're most uh, reliably found. Um, and it's also a high potential for beginner misidentification or a data entry error, right? Like I brought up the anecdote earlier of those experienced birders who just, you know, they were probably in a hurry or, you know, weren't paying as close attention as they should have been and they hit redheaded instead of red-bellied woodpecker on the checklist. Um, and if that thing doesn't trip the filter, then th these are going to look like they're a lot more common than they are um, in our area. Um, and yeah, obviously the way that they actually look doesn't make them an ID uh, issue for even for beginners, but just they're very similar. Um, we have the a red bellied woodpecker, which also has a red head, which is very common. So it's, you often hear, we'll hear a beginning birder say, hey, I saw a red headed woodpecker. And you say, oh really, that's, that's awesome. That's a pretty cool bird. And then you'll ask them a little more questions and you'll figure out that they actually saw a red bellied woodpecker. Um, and so that's another thing to bring up, you know, um, I think I have it on one of the slides coming up, but because there's no uh, minimum required training for people to submit checklists to eBird, the way the filters are set is more or less to the, the lowest common denominator um, as far as ID skills. Um, and so that can be frustrating to more intermediate or advanced birders who are also, you know, having to deal with those, those filters. Um, because, you know, having to provide details for something that, you know, isn't an ID challenge to you and you think is a straightforward ID can be kind of frustrating. Uh, but this is what the filters look like behind the scenes. Um, so you can see on here that uh, for different seasons of the year, there's different maximum counts that are allowable. So you could see up to 25 oven birds and report that on eBird checklist in the month of April um, without 
any kind of flag being drawn from the filter without having to provide any additional details. Um, but over the winter, they're much less common. Um, and if you saw any more than two, um, you would be asked to provide additional details on that sighting. Um, you can see kind of how that works for, I chose the warblers to show here because they have, you know, kind of the seasonality. Um, and again, you know, golden wing warbler, those show up in fall. It's not, you know, people get a little um, uptight, I would say, about the whole rare, birds being called rare by the eBird filter. It's kind of like a loaded word um, in the birding community. There's a lot of different words that are used to describe rare birds. You know, some birds are accidental, some birds are vagrant, some birds are casual, some are annual, some are just uncommon. There's like a whole vocabulary of describing just how rare a bird is. Uh, but for the purpose of eBird, it's just rare enough that we want to have some more details before we let into the database. So it's kind of a lower threshold than most birders would use kind of in the common parlance to talk about a rare bird. Um, so like I was saying about golden wing warbler, we're like, yeah, they show up, but if you have more than one, we're, we're, or if you have one or more, we're going to want details just to confirm it wasn't, you know, a data entry error or, or a misidentification. Um, so yeah, well, and this is a common reaction. This is a reaction that I've had myself to when you're asked to provide additional details on a sighting. Um, you know, a lot of times, especially if you're using the app on your phone in the field, you're already looking away from your binoculars or your spotting scope or your camera. Um, and you're giving up your precious field time to add this checklist, right? And so it can be a little frustrating when you're asked to give up even more field time to add additional details for a sighting that you don't really feel like is that rare. It's an inconvenience to you. Um, but I just wanted to, you know, confirm to everyone that that's a normal kind of reaction to have. And then also kind of some tips on how to handle that. You don't need to write a dissertation for most of the sightings that you have on eBird that get flagged, right? A lot of this stuff is, it's a potential ID issue for beginning, maybe intermediate birders. It's a potential like name confusion issue. Uh, maybe it's a little bit late, it's a little bit early. Um, so you can just write a pretty basic description um, of the bird and that's gonna be fine. If you can get a photo, that's great, that's even better. Um, and another thing to kind of keep in mind is that it's nothing personal against you. Again, it's the lowest common denominator situation for how the filters are set. Anyone who has zero birding experience can start an eBird account right now and submit a, a checklist five minutes from now. So that's who is in mind when the reviewers are building the filters. So don't feel like, oh, well, I know how to identify a redhead a woodpecker. I, how could anyone mess that up? I would never mess that up. Why do I have to provide details about that? Well, just you know, take it easy. You don't need to put a whole lot of details. Um, you can just write a very brief description of it to where we know it's not any kind of a data entry error. Um, for people who are regular contributors to eBird, there's a little bit of trust built in as well from their viewers that we know who's a reliable observer um, who submits checklists all the time from the county. Um, and so I already brought up kind of the example of the reddish egret where, you know, yeah, you can find them in Palm Beach, but it's something that's regularly mis-ID'd, so the filter is set to zero on them. Um, and just a very short description um, will be sufficient um, to get your record accepted into the public database. All right, and then I provided some more what I call comment hacks here. Um, so again, this is just getting back to the, the point that you don't have to write a dissertation whenever you get flagged on a bird. Um, in the instance where you get flagged because it's a high count, like you saw a high number of the birds um, for a particular species, you know, you can just say how you counted them. Was it, you know, just say it was an exact count. And it's like, okay, well, you know, they're confirming that it's not a data entry error. They didn't hit more they didn't accidentally hit a one before the other digit they meant to put in. Um, any other kind of similar uh, phrases? I like to use one by one count. You know, I kept a running tally. Um, sometimes, you know, you have a high count, but you didn't actually count a one by one. Um, you can just say it was a conservative estimate. You know, you're, you're not trying to overcount. You're being very conscious that it's a high number of birds. Um, 
and you're you're kind of downplaying your total number um, because you know it's a high number of birds that you've you've been seeing for whatever reason that day. And then another thing you can add, and a lot of times comes into play, um, is the effort data. So when the reviewers are setting the filters, they're thinking about your average checklist, right? So the average time that you go birding and submit an eBird checklist, you're probably out for one, two, maybe three hours. You're covering one, two, maybe three miles, maybe a little more than that. If you go out and you do a 12 hour sea watch, your count for, you know, even a common bird, something like Royal Turn, an uncommon bird, something like Lester Blackback Gull, you know, over the winter, they're gonna be pretty high. But if you put in like, hey, look at my effort data, I was standing on this pier looking for birds for all day for 12 hours, then it's the reviewer is going to be like, oh, okay, well, that's why their count is as high as it is because their effort is much higher than the average effort, which is what the filters are kind of set to. Um, and then if you see, if you have a bird that you think gets flagged because it's an ID issue, um, just say how you ID'd it. You don't have to go into detail. You don't have to talk about every single feather on the bird, every single field mark that's present in the book. Um, honestly, if you, if you go into that amount of detail where you're talking about every single field mark that's in the book, that's a little suspicious. That kind of makes me think as a reviewer that maybe you, after the fact, went to the book and wrote down every field mark you saw in the book. Whereas in the field, normally it's not how we're birding, right? You normally don't look at, you don't normally don't see every single field mark when you um, see a bird, right? You're using kind of the one, two, three, you know, main field marks that you're using it to separate it from similar species. So you can just say, you know, this was carefully sep separated from, you know, Forster's turn by the fact that it had a dark gray belly for, uh, you know, for, uh, for a common turn or it had, you know, the dark wedge on its wing. Um, you don't have to go into all kinds of detail about what kind of, you know, the basic description of the bird, like, oh, it was approximately eight inches from, you know, tip of the beak to tip of the tail. You can just say it was a vireo that was brownish and it had a dark, you know, mustache stripe. Like that'll, that'll pretty much do it for red whiskered vireo versus red eyed vireo. You don't have to go into, you know, a whole lot of detail on, on those things. And that's just something to think about too. Like when you're getting a uh, sighting that's flagged, just to think about why is this getting flagged? And if you can put in your description, you know, why it's getting flagged, you know, if you mention that, oh, this is, you know, this is a week early. Like I recognize that I'm still submitting it because this is what I saw. It looked like X, Y, Z. Um, that kind of goes a long way to help, help your sighting get um, accepted because it shows the reviewer that you're knowledgeable about, you know, about the status and distribution of birds in your area. Um, and also kind of critically thinking about why is this getting flagged, that will make you a better birder because it just makes you critically think a little bit more about what you're seeing. Um, and so I, I think that's helpful, um, you know, on both ends, both on like making yourself a better birder as an eBird contributor and like helping your viewer uh, along on their, the process, make it a little easier to accept your submissions. And so something that uh, seems to be a large issue, and I think this is um, mostly related to there not being a whole lot of training required um, when you sign up for an eBird account and start submitting checklists, um, is what kind of details is eBird looking for when it asks you for more details about your sighting? Very commonly, people will report a rare bird. Um, eBird will, you know, they'll get the automatic pop-up asking for more details. Um, and they'll put details that really don't help the reviewer assess the record at all. Um, and what eBird is looking for and what the reviewers are looking for is what details did you see to ident that let you identify that bird? Um, and again, it doesn't need to be every field mark that there is in the book. Um, it can just be the very, you know, just be honest. What did you see on the bird that told you it was what it is and it wasn't something else that, you know, is a potential confusion species? A lot of birders will um, put information, um, what I have listed here is common pitfalls. Um, so they'll, this is all great stuff to include, by the way, in addition to the physical characteristics that helped you identify the bird. Um, but it shouldn't be the only thing that you have in your description field. 
So a lot of birders, I think because they view eBird as kind of a bird reporting platform where they're trying to get information out to other birders on how they can refine this cool rare bird that they found, they'll put the location of the bird like, well, it was at trail marker 17, you know, on the left side of the trail and such and such a tree. Um, that's great information to include, like I said, but that's really not what the reviewers are looking for to be able to uh, assess the record to determine whether it's valid or not. And again, other similar stuff like the, the habitat the bird was using, the behavior of the bird, those can both be great um, kind of supportive factors in your ID um, of the bird and, and should be included um, if that's the case in addition to the, the physical characteristics. But a lot of birds will just say, you know, oh, it was, um, you know, it was fly catching from uh, a, a barbed wire fence, but they won't put anything about what the bird actually looked like, you know, um, and that makes it difficult as a reviewer to assess if it's a valid record or not. Um, another thing that people will put in is their experience with the species. So they'll say, I see this species in my backyard in Michigan every day at my feeder, um, you know, and this, that, and the third, well, I don't, I'm not gonna do a background check on you to see where you live or how much experience you have with this particular bird. What I'm looking for is, hey, this was a woodpecker with a bright, you know, redhead, uh, glossy black back and white wing patches. Like that's all I need for a redheaded woodpecker. Um, I don't, you know, you telling me that you've seen thousands of them over the years or you did your dissertation on them in school, like I don't, there's really no way good, you know, quick and, and easy and reliable way for me to verify that kind of information. So uh, that's something that you can include if you want, but it's um, not what's being asked for when you're asked for details. Um, and then a couple other things people will put in, they'll say the bird's unmistakable. It's like, well, you know, you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised at what people will make mistakes on and report to eBird. Um, you know, even when it's backed up by pictures, you know, people, um, like I said, uh, there's no minimum training required. So you have very beginning birders who are unfamiliar with identification, with status and distribution. Um, you know, and the people submit really wacky stuff. So to say a bird's unmistakable, that really doesn't help, you know, the reviewer assess the record. Um, and the next thing too, a lot of people will, instead of putting the description of the bird in, they'll say, this bird isn't that rare. I see them every spring at this site, you know, and they'll go on and on about you know, trying to tell you about the status and distribution of a bird in your area and um, just kind of getting back to the beginning, you don't, it's not necessarily, rare is kind of a loaded word. Um, rare in the terms of being flagged by eBird isn't that rare. Um, we're just wanting like a, a double check to say, hey, yeah, this is, this is a good sighting. I actually did see this. Um, you don't need to go into, into crazy detail and a lot of times, the amount of uh, words that people write telling me that a bird isn't rare, shouldn't be flagged, they could have just written a brief description that would have gotten the bird accepted. But since they didn't provide any of the information that was actually being asked of them, as a reviewer, it's difficult to accept that record. All right, so kind of getting, going more on that vein, I guess. Um, a lot of people ask why their sightings haven't shown up in the public database. When you find a rare bird, it's really cool. And it's a really cool feature of eBird to go back to your house and bring up your computer and look at the, the range map for that bird on eBird and to see that your sighting, you know, is the furthest east sighting for February for, you know, the whole country or, you know, whatever it is. It's cool to see that you found a rare bird and it's not really where it's supposed to be at that time of year. Um, and so, you know, people will often ask like, well, why hasn't my sighting shown up yet? You know, I submitted it on Tuesday, it's Saturday. Um, and they get a little upset about that. I've been there myself as well. So let me go back. So it's important to, uh, to understand that volunteers are reviewers. Um, you know, this isn't a paid position. Um, and so volunteers, you know, might be taking a, a little break from doing, doing reviewing any records. Um, they might be focusing on records that are a little easier to review, um, things that are more cut and dry. Um, your record might not be easy to assess. It may be um, a difficult ID. Uh, you might have submitted photos that are, you know, blurry. Maybe your description wasn't very conclusive. Um, and then again, reviewers are um, 
qualify to be in their position because they understand status and distribution of birds and the identification of birds in their area um, at a high level, but that doesn't mean that they're an omniscient. You know, everyone has uh, bird groups that they're not very confident at identifying. Um, you know, some people might be really good at shorebirds or pids or sparrows or, or hummingbirds. And so if you found, especially something that's hard to ID from one of those, those kind of groups uh, or something that's really rare, um, you know, I know, uh, you know, Kyle's dark bill cuckoo that he found a couple of years ago now, uh, you know, that flew, that threw reviewers for a loop. You know, there's not, your average South Florida reviewer doesn't have, you know, uh, some uh, tropical cuckoo on the mind uh, when, you know, records come through and they're being evaluated. So they might have to send that out to someone that knows a little more about that topic. You know, the whole point of having reviewers is that uh, you're wanting people, you're wanting the database to be accurate. You know, you're wanting to get it right. And if you don't feel confident necessarily um, identifying a certain species, you know, based on what might be kind of suboptimal photos or audio recordings or not the greatest description, you know, it's not uncommon to send that off to someone that you know who is more confident in that and can kind of uh, assess that record um, better than you can. I kind of give a, a little phone a friend there. So that, that could be why your record isn't showing up in the public database. All right, and then, you know, if it's been six months or something and your record still hasn't showed up in the public database, that's probably because it wasn't confirmed. Um, and a lot of times the case is that just not enough information was provided to assess the record. Sometimes those reviewers will follow up and ask for more details. But I have to say, when I've done that, it's been about 80% of the time you don't hear back from, from the observer at all on that. Um, and so it's really not something that's done all the time um, to try to get more information from, from the uh, observer, especially if their details, you know, to begin with are minimal. Um, you know, you're probably not going to get a whole lot out of them anyway, even if they do respond. Um, and another thing is, you know, it's not take it personally. It's not, you know, they don't, it's not the reviewer calling you a liar or, uh, you know, saying that you're, you have poor ID skills. You know, sometimes you just don't get enough. Some birds go on ID, you know, even by the best birders. If you look at some professional ornithologists that you know, or birders that you really look up to that you think are, you know, some of the cream of the crop around, you look at their checklist, you'll see a lot of bird spuzz and a lot of slashes. You know, if someone's identifying 100% of the birds that they see on their checklist, that's a sign of false confidence. Those, you know, you don't identify 100% of the birds. It's just, that's not how it goes. Um, so I just don't take it personally. Sometimes you don't get enough information on it. Um, at the end of the day, the priority is building a robust database. Like I mentioned, um, it gets used for science. It gets used for conservation decisions that have real impacts um, you know, on the conservation of habitats and species. So the priority is getting it right. It's not you know, being everyone's friend and making everyone happy by um, including all the records that get submitted. Um, the photo I included here, this was taken on uh, May 15th on a pelagic trip off of Miami. Um, I'll let everyone kind of look at that photo and see if they can think of what that bird is or could be. Uh, when I saw the bird, I just saw it was a warbler. It looked kind of big, was flying by the boat. I thought I'd get a picture of it to see if I could tell what it was. Um, as you can see, it looks like it has an eye ring. It looks like it has a gray hood, maybe yellow underneath, olive on the back, kind of a short tail. Um, I think it looks kind of good for a Connecticut warbler and the date and location would kind of support that. But, you know, this is one that I didn't submit to eBird as a Connecticut warbler because, you know, I saw it just briefly enough to get a picture of it. Um, I didn't really get enough on it to be 100% sure that's not something else. Maybe it could be a weird angle on a yellow throat. Maybe, um, you know, they'd be really rare at that time of year, but, you know, I didn't see it well enough to separate it from a morning warbler or McGillar Ray's warbler or any other potential confusion species from Connecticut. So, you know, it's something that happens to everyone to, you know, you might not have seen it well enough and you might be really excited. Like, this would have been really cool to be able to have that record. Like this would be plotted, you know, miles out at sea that I saw a Connecticut warbler and I'd be able to tell people, well, yeah, they show up along the coast, but I've actually seen them flying over the, 
blue water of the Atlantic, but you know what? Like I didn't see it. I'm probably like 90% sure that's what it was, but I didn't see it well enough. So I didn't, I didn't submit it. All right, so just moving on, we're getting towards the end here. Um, just some more, a little more behind the scenes action on what the review report looks like. Um, you can see here, if, if you choose to mark any of these records unconfirmed, what you would do is you would um, select uh, this checkbox next to it. And then you have this other box here where you can mark unconfirmed and mark confirmed. And there's all these, all these reasons that, that you can choose. Um, you know, inadequate documentation is probably one of the more common ones that I personally use. Um, you know, like I said, a lot of times people will just put the, the information that we're not looking for in the comment box. And it's just really impossible to accurately identify or accurately assess that record at that point. Um, you know, if, a lot of times when people submit uh, pictures, you can tell that they just, they've misidentified the species. And so you can use that as another option as well. Um, so here's, you know, what it looks like when you would check the check mark and hit accept. And then there's also a reason that pops down here that you have to populate this field before you can complete reviewing the record. We have to say, was it accepted by the Bird Records Committee? Um, was it documented properly with field notes? So that's the description that you would type in. Um, or did they include like a photo, uh, video, or audio clip? Um, there is a, a section for observer experience. I shy away from that, using that. Sometimes I'll use that for like Richard Crossley when he's in the area birding. Um, he wants to report some kind of a gull hybrid from the Palm Beach landfill or something like that. But you know, um, you really, the higher standard is to actually have some kind of documentation on file that you have field notes, you have a picture um, to, to back up the record. Um, your assessment of whether a bird is experienced or not is really not the highest standard. Um, and just kind of to highlight the challenges that uh, exist with data uh, quality control um, for the database. Um, if you look at uh, the kind of explore section of eBird and you get into the explore photos and audio, you can narrow it down um, to a location and a species. So I was looking at, Palm, at Wilson's Plover records for Palm Beach. Um, and this is within five minutes. Like the other day, I was like, oh, it'd be cool to show people this. Let me go see if I can find a picture that's identified incorrectly on the on the uh, website that's, you know, actually these are sightings that have been already added to the public database. And, you know, it took less than five minutes to find this one. Um, I'm not putting this out there to, you know, call out anyone or shame anyone for, for putting a wrong picture up or making a misidentification. Like I said, it happens to everyone. It's pretty easy to do with pictures. If you're, you know, trying to select the right thumbnail, you might pick the wrong one. If you're trying to remember the file number where it's just a string of letters and numbers, it's pretty easy to, you know, transpose some numbers and pick the wrong, the wrong picture. But, um, you know, and this, this is a way also um, that I wanted to bring up that yeah, anyone can participate in the review process. If you want to go look at photos and try to find some that are misidentified, um, that helps out the, the reviewers. Um, in that case, that record was actually validated by a reviewer. Uh, what happens a lot of times with, with records like that is that the observer might say, uh, I saw this uh, bird here and I'm going to add the photos later, the reviewer might look and see that, oh, hey, people have been seeing that Wilson's Plover at that site for a week now. So I know it's there. I'll just accept it. There's an option that you can choose that says species known to be present at site. And then the people act, add the photos later after the record's already been validated. And so that's how some of those creep into the database that way. But yeah, anyone can look at photos and you can flag it and you can make a comment and say, hey, this is actually their own species. It's actually this. Um, and that's a good way, um, like I said, for you to help the reviewers and help eBird uh, make sure the database is really top notch like we want it to be. Um, and also it's a good way to practice your ID skills. You know, and you'll see a lot of times the photos aren't the best and it's a little bit of a challenge to see some of the identifying features. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of, if you got some time to kill, it's a, a good way to practice some of your skills, identifying photos. Um, and then uh, just winding it down, I've included kind of some best practices um, for submitting eBird checklists. So we kind of went over a lot about uh, kind of my experiences and some of my pet peeves and stuff with being an eBird reviewer. Um, but when you're submitting um, your checklist, the whole idea is that you want this to be repeatable. Right, you want someone to be able to go and cover the same area that you covered 
25 years or 50 years, 100 years from now and see what the change has been, you know, in the bird life of that area. Um, and so to allow that to happen, you, you kind of have to add a little more detail than eBird requires you as the bare minimum to put in. Um, so like you'd have to know what kind of habitat was covered. Um, I know Audubon runs a lot of trips um, and a lot of birders in the area go on their own a lot to Locks, Locks Hatchie National Wildlife Refuge. Um, there's a diversity of habitat there. If you stay the entire two hours that you're there by the cypress strand, your checklist is gonna look a lot different than if you spent two hours on the berm scanning out over the marsh or, or uh, covering some of the, the wetland cells that they have there. So putting what kind of habitat you, you covered is really important to allow your checklist to be repeated at any point in the future uh, for kind of conclusions to be able to be drawn about that. The same thing is true for weather. Um, you know, if you go out to a site and it's, raining cats and dogs, you're going to get a really different checklist than if you go out and it's, you know, a mild 72 degree day and it's sunny with no wind out. Uh, that's, uh, that also holds true for stuff like human disturbance. Um, if you go to a site and it's loaded with people, you're going to see a lot less birds. You know, like in the case of a beach, for example, you're generally going to see less birds than if you go to a site and it's, you know, uh, very few people around. Um, and then any kind of other things that you're doing that might affect the, how many birds you're seeing. You see a lot more birds when you uh, employ the pishing technique or when you use a mob tape or when you use callback. So that's kind of important to include in the comments of your checklist that, hey, yeah, I was stopping every five minutes and pishing or playing my screech owl tape uh, because you're gonna see way more birds doing that than if you were just you know completely silent walking along. Um, then another thing too is um, try to avoid uh, long distance or long duration checklists. Um, it's a little bit of a hassle, you know, when you're doing a sea watch to stop every hour, every two hours or something and start a new checklist. Um, but it, it just, uh, it improves the quality of the database if you are able to put in that extra effort to do that. All right, so I said at the top of the presentation and I wanted to say it again now with a, a bad pun to give a full-throated cheer of thanks to our magnificent eBird contributors. Um, you know, there's sometimes a little bit of an adversarial relationship that's perceived between the reviewers and, and the, the eBird contributors, but you know, the reviewers are contributors as well, and, and the success of the database really um, depends on uh, you know, the contributors continuing to submit checklists and to do their best job at you know, counting birds and identifying birds, and so, um, you know, it all really rests on the shoulders of the eBird contributors. And so thank you um, to you all. All right, and with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. All right, we have a bunch of questions um, in the uh, chat box. And if you have any more, uh, please ask them. So let me, let me get started so we can get through them. Uh, the first, uh, there's two on filters. Uh, what, did, what does it mean when you say, I set the filter to zero? And that's from CJ McCartney. Sure, so that just means that if you see a single bird of that particular species, that it's gonna trip the filter. Um, so the maximum allowable count is zero. Okay, and do eBird reports indicate any filters passed? Um, I think what they're maybe asking there is like how, um, like in time, like we submit, that's something that we see too. If you submit a checklist from say the seventies when it's like a species like uh, scrub jays, a lot more common um, in the county, um, that would get flagged as if it was, you know, the filters are, are, are set basically for the current time but any past sightings that are submitted will get flagged based on those filters. So even though if you were setting filters in 1970, you wouldn't have scrub J set at zero, whereas in 2020 you would, um, things get caught up in the filters that kind of way too. I think that's what they're asking, but. Okay. Uh, uh, many people are submitting lists for birds they are seeing in at their feeders or in yards. What details do you suggest they include in their list? And that's from Mary Dunning. Sure, um, like, like I mentioned, um, if you're having stuff that's getting flagged, you know, it's just the description of the birds. You can put a little bit on behavior if you want, um, especially to help you to identify the birds. Um, 
but yeah, anything about um, if you want to mention that it was a feeder, right? That's going to um, influence the repeatability of the checklist, um, the weather, things like that. Um, I hope that answers what she was getting at there. Okay. Uh, can you add a photo of a bird to eBird? Debbie Smith asked that. Can you repeat that? Can you add a photo of a bird to eBird? Debbie Debbie Smith asked that. I guess she's asked. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, you can. Yeah, that's a big um, uh, focus of the the database now. Um, you can. I've, I'm not sure exactly what the limit is per sighting, but you can add actually a number of photos of every bird that you've seen um, per checklist. Okay, here's a question from a new birder, Jeanette Mitchell. I'm a new birder and reported three swallowtail kites in November, which I thought were unmistakable, but high in the sky. Ebert said it was unusual to see three of them together. I didn't know how to respond, a new birder after all. I just said what I saw, that I saw three. What else could I say? So that is a, a, you know, a pretty unusual sighting that's pretty late for swallowtail kites to be around. Normally, you know, they start migrating as early as July. Um, so if you're seeing three together as late as November, that's pretty rare. And that, you know, it may suggest that they would be birds from further up north. Um, but, you know, like I mentioned um, a little early in the presentation, it's just the actual description of the birds that you saw. So you would say that they had deeply forked tails um, that they were a medium-sized raptor, that, um, you know, saying that they were soaring high in the sky is like a good behavioral um, identification feature for swallowtail kites. You know, they had the black and white pattern on them. Um, yeah, just it's just a physical description of what you saw um, and highlighting the relevant field marks that you saw that allowed you to ID it is what the reviewers are looking for. Okay, great. Uh, so, and this kind of also speaks to, you know, all us birders who have made mistakes on eBird, and I know I have. Uh, birders should think of an ID mistake as an opportunity to learn. Even expert makes, make mistakes. And this is said by Susan Young, who I know is a very active birder in eBird in the area. Uh, yeah, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm go ahead. Sorry. No, I'm just going to agree with that. Absolutely. You know, if you make a mistake you'll, and, you know, you, you have, uh, you're able to recognize it or maybe one of your birding um, partners recognizes it for you and calls you out on it. Um, so, yeah, it is a great learning opportunity to say, well, why did I think that was the wrong thing? What was I looking at that met, led me astray or what was I not looking at that I should have been that would have helped me identify correctly? So, yeah, absolutely. Great. Yeah, and I know I've learned a lot from uh, the identification process. Uh, are eBird reviewers open to new species types being added to the area standard checklist? Sometimes I want to add a species, but it isn't available. And this is from Ryan Kelly. Yeah, that's like a little bit of a, um, a kind of, I'd have to dig and look and see what the official eBird position is that is on that. Um, it's a little bit redundant sometimes, is my personal opinion, um, when people want to add subspecies when it's the expected subspecies for the area. Like if you want to say that it's a barn swallow and then in parentheses that it's the American barn swallow, like, well, yeah, of course we're in America, that's you'd expect to see that species. So me personally, I feel like that kind of clogs up um, the database a little bit to have things that are redundant like that. But yeah, you know, if you saw a Eurasian wimbrel, by all means, you know, report that as a Eurasian wimbrel, uh, you know, so that we can, we, because that's unusual. But for species that are, are subspecies that are um, expected to be found in the region, personally, I find that to be a little bit redundant. I see, based on the way that other filters are built, that other reviewers are a little more permissive on that. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure what exactly the official Cornell eBird stances on that, but for me and myself, that's that's my position on it. Okay, we're running later than usual, everybody. I just wanted to say that, but since we're online and you're all comfortably at home and don't have to drive home tonight, and I'm just gonna continue with the questions because there are a few more really good questions. Um, do reviewers like to have a description as well as a photo for a flag species? Sometimes I see just photos, and this is again from Susan Young. So yeah, I mean, if it's a, a good photo, um, then that's fine. Um, I don't think twice if there's not a description accompanying, if I can see all the relevant field marks and, you know, especially the habitat around it and stuff like that. 
Um, if it's a blurry photo, you're going to want to put some details on there of like, you know, yeah, I saw this. I wasn't able to get the great photo. This was my impressions from the field, what I actually saw on that. You can kind of put those two things together where you have a description and you have like a blurry out of focus kind of photo and you'd be like, oh, okay, you know, you're, um, that'll help you assess the record. Yeah. Uh, if, if, uh, again, this is from Susan Young, another, another, uh, kind of question comment. If I see a mistaken ID in a, in a list that doesn't have a photo, uh, like burrowing owl at Lakota Hatchie, uh, how can I report that mistake? I am going to have to get back to you on that one. I think there's a way that you can flag an entire checklist. Um, so I have permissions as a reviewer, so I can I can do that for Palm Beach. I'm not sure as a, if you don't have those permissions, what because I've been frustrated by that same thing as well. Where like I used to bird all the time at MacArthur uh, Beach Park, and there's one checklist where for a single day in April, this guy said that he saw like 90 species, and it was a lot of like rarities and freshwater type species sure. that you know wouldn't ever be there. And I just want you know. I wanted those off of the check because I was working a lot on trying to build the checklist for a particular site, and I don't think there is a way. Um, so you can email me um, about that, and I can um, I can take a look at any of those those records. Great. Uh, you mentioned that in identifying um, uh, how you saw what you did to as you were birding to help you see the bird, and one thing you mentioned was fishing. And Kristen Murta asks, are you recommending fishing? Um. I mean, so any kind of like uh, distraction technique, whether it be pishing or playback or screech owl tape, it just needs to be used in an ethical manner. Um, and you guys can all consult the American Birding Association, you know, ethics uh, statement or page on that. It's available on their website. Um, you know, outside of the breeding season, if you want to do a little pishing, do a little playback, do a little mob tape action, um, you know, you're really going to increase the uh, your detection probability for birds and you're going to submit a more complete and a more accurate checklist of what birds are present on site. If you're targeting a breeding species, especially something that's imperiled, um, you probably want to stray away from doing any kind of playback like that or, um, you know, even kind of curtail your pishing. How about, you also how about to, sorry, I just want to add on, you also want to check your local guidelines, like there's specific rules if you're in a national park or or things like that, where they're uh, those, they prohibit those kinds of activities. How about fishing during migration season? Like, for example, during uh, spring migration when birds have crossed uh, from South America up into Florida. And uh, do you does eBird have a position in terms of fishing at those times? So again, I'm I'm not um, speaking on on behalf of eBirds. So it's just my personal opinion that I can contribute. Um, it just takes a little common sense. I mean, if you're seeing birds that are so exhausted that their canopy species that you're seeing foraging on a lawn, it's probably not a good idea to go and pish. The other thing about that too is that if they're not on any associated with any kind of a territory, they're going to be a little less responsive to pishing anyway. Um, it's not like a wintering bird or a breeding bird where they're going to be more territorial and more responsive to playback or pishing or sc screech owl tape. Um, so it's, it's just a matter of using common sense. If the birds are obviously exhausted and they're having a hard, hard go of it, you probably don't want to be pishing. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Stan, for clarifying that. Uh, one more question and a couple of comments. When I'm monitoring the rooftop and do not want to give location of, uh, least, of least turns, what are my options? So there are some species that are flagged by eBird as sensitive and those, those location details won't uh, go out. Um, I think painted bunting is the one um, that I can think of for our area. Um, you can just write a, a general um, location. Uh, eBird does allow you to submit checklists just at the county level. Um, and then you can have those for your own personal records and you'll know where they are, even though you submitted them to the, the database at the county level. Um, there's also an option for you to hide your checklist. So like I've had to do that um, when I've been doing some surveys on areas that are restricted access and the landowner doesn't want, um, you know, the bird sightings on that area to be publicized. Um, you can just, there's a, I forget exactly where it is on the checklist. I'd have to look back now. Um, but there is an option where you can uh, make those sightings not public. Oh, great. 
That's, that's really good to know. Um, so a couple of, uh, oh, what are your thoughts about reporting exotic escapee birds? This is again asked by Susan Young. Um, so I don't know if you guys saw, I guess I'll go back a couple slides, but there is an option to, un, to not confirm a bird uh, if it is introduced or exotic. Hmm. Um, so it's, yeah, you know, exactly what constitutes, you know, established species versus, you know, things that are still, you know, exotic release releases. Um, again, it's something that kind of clogs up the database and um, a little bit. If, if you, it's your list though, if you want to submit them, um, even if it doesn't go, even if it isn't confirmed by the reviewer, you know, you'll still have it in your record so you can see, you know, that you saw an Arge build wax bill at, you know, this park in Broward or, or whatever it may be. Is there, is there, are there a couple of common ones that you keep seeing over and over again? I haven't noticed that as an issue in Palm Beach. Um, we have a lot of uh, exotic species that are pretty well established at this point. Um, but as far as like your, you know, kind of ones and twos of just random stuff that's escaped, I haven't, I haven't personally noticed a, a, you know, a big influx of those for Palm Beach. Uh, I have a question. If you can say, what's the most off the wall species that's ever been submitted in Palm Beach County that you just said, what? <laughs> and threw your hands up? I honestly, for Palm Beach, I can't really think of a really wacky sighting that anyone has um, submitted. Um, that's just been totally off the wall. I'm on a, you know, I'm on a group email with some other reviewers where, you know, um, across the country, and they'll, they'll send out some that are really wacky, especially like I said for um, the uh, Great Backyard Bird Con in February. Um, they had one where they had, I think it was a merganser that someone claimed was perched in the back of a tree in their backyard or um, I think it was a red-breasted merganser. It wasn't even a hooded that you might expect to be in a, you know, in a tree. Um, uh, it's, it's hard to keep track of them all. There's not one from Palm Beach um, that I can really, uh, that really sticks out in my mind though. Uh, so uh, just a couple of compliments. Great presentation, Dan, learned a lot. I do most of photography but I have a different perspective from some of the birders I see or travel with. And thanks, Marks Slipkin. And reviewers have a hard job, appreciate the hard work you do, Susan Young. Um, Linda McCandless says this was a fabulous presentation. Uh, thanks, uh, Paula Gattrell says thank you, an informative presentation. And that's all we have for questions and comments. Uh, Dan, that was great. I'm sure we all learned a, a lot in terms of our uh, experiences on how to approach eBird in the future, uh, some ways that we can both make it easy for ourselves and, and easier for you as well, which I think we would like to do. So you have a little less work uh, when you are going through those eBird uh, reviews. Thanks again, Mark. I mean, and thanks again, Dan. Yeah, thank you. I enjoyed it. Um, and anyone uh, can contact me with any other questions that they have. Okay, and Fred Quinn says thank you. Richard Rick Schofield says thanks, Stan. And great presentation. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Okay. Uh, real quickly, let me just share my screen and we will end the evening. Um, So uh, we will see you next uh, month on December 1st. That's exactly three weeks from now because we started a week late and November has 30 days. So the uh, first Tuesday in December comes out on December 1st. Uh, we will have Melissa Minitz. I think I'm pronouncing her name correctly, probably not, uh, uh, who is, will talk about being your own birder. She's a writer, blogger, birder. And I think you'll find her presentation uh, different and it really, really enjoyable because her blogs are really enjoyable and she has a really great perspective on birding. And again, that's Tuesday, December 1st at 7 p.m. So please be there for that wonderful presentation. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you, thank you to our presenters, uh, Dan O'Malley and Clive Pinnock. Thank you to um, uh, Kathy and to Chris for helping explain the Articles of Incorporation. 
And thank you to uh, um, Rich Raphael for doing the background work of administrating this uh, presentation. Uh, you don't see him, but he does a lot of the work behind the scenes that you have no idea uh, how much it is. So thanks, thanks again to everybody for, for all you did for to make tonight happen. And have a wonderful week, month, and see you on December 1st. Take care, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Scott. Sure. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> Thank you, Rich. Good night. Ready to stop recording? Yes, you're ready to stop recording. <laughs> Are you, don't, are you even co-host anymore? Thank you, everybody, for participating in the vote. Uh, yeah, that went really well, oh. smoothly. That was Scott, great. You, uh, you have to stop the recording. Now, um, yeah. oh, okay, I'll, I'll stop it. I'll stop okay. it. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm not understanding what I... It's, it's not appearing on my screen for some reason. Um, huh. And you got kicked out. Stop recording. Okay, I got it. I got it.